Hello to my friends joining us via recording. During today's session, we are going to be working through the lesson number one for the lab. We took a poll and the things we're most interested in hearing about are our directional terms, um, organ system functions, and some of those organs in them, and body cavities. So we'll see what we can get through today during, during our time together. So this picture, is a picture that we have um, posted in the guided lesson for you this week. Um, so if you look up the, the part of the guided lesson that, that talks about directional terms, I pulled this directly from there. What I like about this picture is instead of me going through and giving you the word description of what your directional terms mean, this is a way for me to show you a, a visual description of what those words mean. Now you have to pair them up with, with your um, descriptions, right, the words, but hopefully as we talk through them, we can, can clear up anything that, that might be giving us a little bit of trouble. Uh, there was a question in the chat if I posted this PowerPoint for you. I did not. Um, all the pictures in this PowerPoint actually came from the guided lesson. So you have all of this in, in that link to your online guided lesson for lesson number one in lab. I just pulled them and put them in the PowerPoint. So um, you don't have this because it's nothing new, <laughs> put it that way. Okay, so the, the first thing I'll mention from our picture, and we're gonna start with our picture over here on the left side of the screen. This picture shows me a person in what's called anatomical position. And I think there was a little bit of a discussion about this in your, um, your packet and your lesson outline. Anatomical position is, is super awkward. Nobody actually stands that way. Um, but anatomical position is gonna be really important for us when we start talking about front versus back of the body. So um, briefly, when we talk about anatomical position, a reminder for you that that means that you're standing straight up. So that, that's pretty normal for us, none of the slouching though. So anatomical position, you're standing straight up. What makes it awkward is this right here, what's going on with the hands. So in anatomical position, your palms are always facing forward. Um, this is important because that tells me all the muscles that live inside your forearm that are on the same side as the palm. We call them anterior, or they're on the front side. And all the muscles that live on the back side of your arm, that is the side by the, the back of the hand, they're posterior. And when we start talking about movements in the second half of the semester, always pretend like you, your body's starting in this awkward position like this. Always pretend we're in anatomical position where we're standing straight up, our palms are facing forward, we're looking forward. That's anatomical position. So we've already mentioned a couple of the directional terms of the body and that, that relate strongly to anatomical position. There's anterior, which means that I've got a structure that's toward the front side of the body. And then there's posterior, which means it's a structure that's closer to the back side of the body. Now, I've gotten a lot of email questions about uh, directional terms this week. And um, when you're thinking about directional terms, there's, there's this phrase, I guess I can't actually type when I'm here. Um, there, there's this phrase uh, called KISS. You've maybe heard of it before. KISS stands for keep it simple, stupid. Um, I'm not calling you stupid, but that's what the phrase says. So keep it simple, basically. If, if I'm looking at two structures in the body and the best way to compare them is one is definitely in front of another one, I would use the word anterior. Or if I'm looking at the structure and one is definitely behind the other, then I would use the word posterior. So a lot of times what gives us trouble with directional terms is we overthink it. I have students tell me that all the time. Oh, I just overthink it. Keep it simple. Whatever looks like the most obvious comparison, that's what we're going with. So if something is, is definitely in front of something else, we would use the relationship anterior versus posterior. Uh, if something, yeah, so anterior is in front of, absolutely, and posterior is behind, definitely. That's a great, great summary of what those are. Sometimes when we're comparing structures in the body, the best way to talk about them is one is kind of toward the middle of the body, and one is more toward the outside of the body. If there's something that's definitely farther over to the left side or the right side than the other, that's the way that's easiest to compare them, I would use the terms medial and lateral. So if something is closer to the middle of the body, we would call that medial, more toward the middle. If something is farther toward the outside of the body, we would call that lateral, toward, toward the outside. 
So medial toward the middle, lateral toward the outside. Um, a great comparison that I like to make with these, you guys are learning bones this week. So um, there's this bone that's in the very middle of your chest. Can someone help me out in the chat? The chat? What's the name of, we call it your breastbone sometimes, or the one that's in the very middle of the chest? You know that? Yeah, a couple of us are chiming in, definitely. The, the, the bone in the very middle of your chest is called the sternum. Uh, so I really like to compare the sternum uh, for example, to the bone that's up here in your arm, which bone lives up here, the biggest bone in the arm? Who's up here? Yeah, I've, I've, got a, I've got a few of us chiming in here. The bone up here is the humerus. So a great way to compare the sternum to the humerus. Well, the humerus is, is way farther away from the middle. The sternum is right in the middle. So that would be a time when I would I would use that directional term medial versus lateral, something that's very much in the middle, something that's very much on the outside, medial versus lateral. I might also compare things based on how um, high up or down they are on the body. So if I'm looking at a structure, for example, uh, anything in the head, if I'm looking at something in the head and I'm looking at something in the legs, for example, uh, the most obvious way to compare those things would be using superior versus inferior. So something that's up high is superior. Something that's down lower is inferior. So I use those terms to compare if I'm up high or if I'm down low. Now, I cannot use superior and inferior when I'm comparing structures that are both on a limb. So if they're both on the arm, or if they're both on the leg, I have special words that I use for that. And those words are proximal and distal, like you see right here. Proximal and distal still kind of tell me um, if we're up higher or down lower, but these terms proximal and distal, when we're talking about those terms, I'm not completely just referencing to what's up higher or what's down lower these two terms are compared to where that limb attaches. So if that, that sounds funky for me to talk about where a limb attaches, just make a note for yourself that proximal and distal, when I use these words, we're saying, how close are you to the shoulder? Or we're saying, how close are you to the hip? If you're really close, if you're in close proximity to the hip um, or to the shoulder, we'd say you're proximal. If it's really far away from the hip or from the shoulder, there's a great distance away from it, we would say that that is distal. So proximal and distal used to describe structures that are both on the same limb. Uh, something that trips us up sometimes, if I'm comparing a bone on the leg to a bone on the arm, those are on two different, they call them two different appendages. So they're not on the same arm or the same leg. That would be a time where I would use superior and inferior. So you only can use proximal and distal if we're comparing something that's on the same arm or the same leg. So keep, keep that in mind. So two structures on an arm, two structures on a leg, proximal and distal. This may be the one picture that you guys don't have in the guided lesson that I wanna take a moment to, to point out over on the, the right side of the screen. This is a picture that represents for us what the directional terms superficial and deep mean. Superficial and deep are a way of me comparing structures that wrap around each other. That's maybe the, the easiest way I can, can describe it. Uh, if we were in class together, I would pull up a skeleton in the front of the class and we would pretend that I was putting my hand representing its heart in the very middle of the rib cage. And I would ask you guys if there are ribs that we could say are in front of the heart, which those are the ribs that would attach to the sternum. So the answer to that question would be yes. I would ask you guys if there are ribs behind the heart, which are the parts of the ribs that you feel in your back. So the answer would be yes. And I would ask you guys if there are ribs that are lateral to the heart, meaning ribs that are on the left or the right side of the heart. And the answer would still be yes. 
because I can't compare the heart by saying that, oh, the ribs are in front of it, or the ribs are behind it, or the ribs are lateral to it, because the ribs are everywhere surrounding that heart, I would say that the heart is deep or it's completely surrounded by those ribs. Or I could say that the ribs are superficial, meaning they're on the outside surrounding that structure. So when you're thinking about when you should be using the words deep and superficial, when we talk about something that wraps all the way around something, that's when we're gonna use deep and superficial. If it doesn't wrap all the way around it, then we've got other directional terms that would make more sense. But when we're considering deep and superficial, think about how the heart is in the very middle of your rib cage. That's a great way to think about the relationship between deep and superficial. Hey, yesterday when I had someone come uh, to my office hour to ask a question, um, we actually talked about how there's something in the body that is considered the most superficial thing the thing that is always the closest to the outside of the body. Can you guys figure out what I might be talking about? What's the most superficial thing on your body? Any guesses? Yeah, so several chiming in. The most superficial thing on your body is your skin. So anytime I compare anything to the skin, we're always going to say that the skin is superficial it's on the outside compared to anything else because everything in your body is wrapped up inside your skin. Um, if we're comparing the heart to skin, for example, we would say that the heart is deep while the, to the skin, or we could say the skin is superficial to the heart. So here's what we, we've talked about so far. We've talked about the general meanings of these, these directional terms. I want to pull up the um, some of those statements that you had in the worksheet and we'll talk about some of them. Maybe we'll try to fill some of them in together and, and I'll mention to you the importance of the order of structures when I use these directional terms. So uh, let's go to that first, see if it'll let me. Here's that first set of statements or so the first half of your statements that you're using directional terms for. Now as a heads up, um, 100%, we need to be able to do things like this, where I give you a couple of structures in the body and you have to fill in the blank with the right directional term. We have to do this on the homework assignment and I guarantee you're gonna have to do this on the midterm exam as well. So we definitely wanna be practicing how to fill in the blanks on, on our statements with directional terms. And remember the the, uh, phrase that I told you guys with these directional terms. Keep it simple. Whatever seems the most obvious is going to be uh, going to be the relationship between these things. Since I'm doing this in PowerPoint, it's probably going to make me write. So I'm going to do my very best to write and not look terrible, um, but I can't guarantee what it's going to look like. I apologize in advance. Um, let's start with the easiest one that I see up here. Uh, the easiest one that I see up here is we're comparing the urinary bladder to the lungs. Now, before you tell me what goes in the blank, what I want you to, to help me with right now, if you were to describe the, the general location of the lungs, where in the body might you say that the lungs are found? How would we describe that? to someone in the easiest words possible. Where are those lungs? Yeah, so a couple of us are, are tossing out chest. I love it, that's easy. My uh, my three-year-old, she could, she could find the chest. So the lungs are a structure that I find in the chest. When I'm talking about the urinary bladder, that's one um, that might not be quite as easy to describe, uh, but if I were to try to describe the location of the urinary bladder, uh, in as easy words as I can think of, um, I might say that it, it's found kind of in the bottom of the torso. So when you're, you're labeling your pictures of the organs, the urinary bladder is one of them in the small model. We can't see it as well on the, mod the big picture of the model, but the urinary bladder found at the very bottom of what's called the abdominal pelvic cavity. So uh, 
we've got the urinary bladder that's found in the bottom of the abdominal pelvic cavity. We've got the lungs that are found in the chest. The easiest comparison I can think of of those things, I got something up high in the chest and I've got something down low in, in the abdominal pelvic cavity. My two options then when I'm comparing these things are, are the words superior and inferior. So this is where it becomes important for us to look at the order that the organs are, are listed in. So the first organ on my list is the urinary bladder in this statement. I want to describe what the urinary bladder is to the lungs. That's my second structure. Now, another good approach when you're, you're looking at, at statements like this, maybe the directional terms are a little bit funky to you right now. You're not really comfortable with those directional terms. But I bet you're comfortable with normal person words instead of anatomy words. So I'm talking about one structure that's down low, and I'm talking about one structure that's up high. If I were to put it in easy words, I would say that the urinary bladder is below, right? Or it's lower than the lungs. That's my normal person word. And once I know my normal person word, then I'm gonna put in my anatomy word, which yeah, Miriam put in the chat for us. My anatomy word for this blank is inferior, inferior. So my statement says the urinary bladder is inferior to the lungs or in easy person words, the urinary bladder is below the lungs. Now it is possible that instead of, of me asking you what the urinary bladder is compared to the lungs, we could also write this statement as the lungs Oh, this is so hard. <coughs> Excuse me. Wow. That was just terrible. Maybe I flip my organs in the opposite direction. Maybe my statement now says the lungs are blank to the bladder. Now I flipped the order on them. Yeah, so now instead of my structure at the beginning being <clears throat> below the other, now my structure is above. Since my structure is above, I flip those directional terms. So you guys are lighting up the chat for me. Thank you as I'm, I'm dying over here. You're <clears throat> absolutely right in the chat. The lungs are superior to the bladder. So depending on the order that I put my, my structures in, I, I still use the same pair of words, <clears throat> superior versus inferior. But if the lungs come first, the word that I'm going to put in my statement is superior. If the bladder comes first, I'm going to put in the word inferior. So there's an example for us of superior versus inferior. Hey, I'll mention, we talked a little bit about bones. Earlier, we actually talked about the humerus bone, the one that's found in your upper arm. The humerus bone is an upper arm bone. The ulna is a bone that's lower in the arm. Since both of these are in the arm, we can only use those terms proximal and distal to describe them. So we're making a comparison here between two arm bones. And remember, with arm bones, we compare how close they are to their attachment site. So the humerus is the bone that you have up here in your arm compared to the ulna. The ulna lives down here in the pinky side of your arm. So the ulna is farther away. The humerus is closer. So we're in closer proximity to the attachment point. That means when I compare these two bones, since the humerus is first, I'd say the humerus is proximal to the ulna. As I sit here and try to write with my mouse of these words, I'm remembering why I, I usually use collaborate and just type on things. I apologize for my uh, my scrawling writing here. So the humerus is proximal to the ulna. If I flipped it the other direction, if I said that the ulna was blank to the humerus, 
what word would I use if I was comparing the ulna to the humerus? What word would I use instead? Yeah, several chiming in for me. If the ulna came first, I'd use that word distal. Absolutely. Let me take a quick peek here. I want to do, okay, let's, let me see what we did so far. Superior, inferior, proximal, distal. Uh, let's, let's do this one right here. The next statement we're going to do here is, is comparing the vertebrae to the sternum. If you were to describe to, uh, to a kid, to my daughter, my three-year-old, where the vertebrae are found, where might you say you'd find your vertebrae? Where could she feel her vertebrae if she wanted to? Yeah, so I've got, got some of us that are mentioning on the back side or behind. Um, yeah, so your vertebrae are the bones that go from the base of your skull all the way down to your tailbone. Actually, we've got three different types of vertebrae that make up your spine. So vertebrae, we're talking about bones in the back. And we already talked about this bone, the sternum here. The sternum is the bone in the very center of, of the chest. Now, your, your vertebrae run along the very center of your back. And like I said, the sternum is the very center of the front. They're both in the middle. So I can't use the directional terms lateral versus medial. They're both in the very middle. But one of them is in the very middle on the front. That's the sternum. One of them is in the very middle on the back. That's the vertebrae. Because I have two things in the middle, the best way to compare them is front versus back. So my vertebrae are the things that are on the back side of the body. So my easy person word for something that's kind of more toward the back side, say it's behind, right? And my anatomy word for something being behind like I'm seeing some of us put in the chat there, is posterior. The vertebrae are posterior. They're behind the sternum. I can flip it the other way, though. If my question says that the sternum is blank to the vertebrae, what's my opposite word from posterior? What means it's on the front side of the body instead? Yeah, so a couple of us are chiming in. Opposite of posterior is anterior. So these two things, the most obvious comparison between them, one of them's on the front, one of them is on the back. We'd use anterior and posterior. Hey, here's that comparison that, that we already made, right, when we were, we were talking about a couple of our terms. Remember that the heart is completely surrounded by the ribs. So what was that word I used again when, when something is completely surrounded? We'd say that the heart is what to those ribs? I'll try to write surrounded here while you type. Surrounded. Right, so I got several lists to put in the, in the chat. The, the thing that's surrounded, the word I use for that is deep. Deep is the word that I use for that. Here's the other example I mentioned for you, though, is, right? When we talked about the skin, that the skin is the thing that completely surrounds everything. So skin is going to be the opposite of deep. Skin is always going to be superficial. Doesn't matter what I'm comparing it to, the skin is superficial. Man, that's a hard word to write. I'm glad you all can type. That's so much faster. There we go. Superficial. Okay, uh, we did deep, superficial, posterior, anterior, superior, infer, and then proximal, distal. There, there was a question on here um, about the phalanges. So um, let me toss this one out, out to the class here, and then I'll, I'll make sure I got it for you, Lauren. When we're talking about the phalanges of the foot, uh, by the way, if you were to describe in easy person words what the phalanges of the foot are, it's actually a really easy word for them. Do we know what that easy word is for those phalanges? Yeah, these are the toes. Okay, so my question is the, the toe bones 
are blank to the femur. These are two structures that are on a leg. So my only options are proximal and distal, right? So my toes are what to my femur? Which word would I use there? I know it's hard when you have to type in your answers, right? Um, looks like, like we're generally agreeing here. The toes are going to be distal. The toes are distal to the femur. Hey, check this out. What if my question said the phalanges of the hand? If I change that to the phalanges of the hand, which word would I use now? Any guesses? The phalanges of the hand. Hey, so we're agreeing it's either. Okay, so, oh, we got lots of options here. Okay, so I'm seeing superior, inferior. I'm seeing lateral. So comparing lateral, medial. Um, I would say your best comparison is, is going to be the fact that, that one of them, so think about a person doing a jumping jack. If I was in class with you, by the way, I would have made you guys do jumping jacks with me this morning. So we're at a distance. I won't make anyone do that. But if I've got my hands up, I'm doing a jumping jack. I got my friend over here. I like to call him yoga in the park guy, by the way. I know he's a little hard to see, uh, but yoga in the park guy here. He's got one arm up and the other arm back down here. When I'm talking about his fingers and I'm comparing them to his thigh bone, remember, keep it simple. What's the most obvious comparison between, between these two structures? Yeah, my, my most obvious Nicole mentioned for us would be superior versus inferior. This one's up high and this one's down low. So I would say the easiest comparison between the fingers and the femur would be that the fingers are up higher than the femur is. I can understand for those of us that said lateral too, though, I can understand that one too. And you would probably get credit for that on, on uh, the quiz or the exam for that. So I guess we don't do quizzes. Sorry, that's an on-site. So you would get credit for that um, for, for the exam if you said that the fingers were lateral because they're for, farther toward the outside, correct? Yeah. Um, so Nicole asks, so you change the anatomical position to compare arms. Um, what I would say with that is we use anatomical position. Um, th that's our most basic comparison. Um, and you want to, uh, so let me clarify how superior inferior works with the fingers compared to the femur. When you think about structures, think about all of the structure and not just part of it. Um, so if we were trying to compare where the phalanges were compared to, um, the fingers for some, if you had any trouble with the idea of the phalanges being superior, um, when you're in anatomical position, they, they kind of are at the same height. Um, but remember how your femur goes all the way down into the knee. So comparing it um, that way, we would say that the phalanges, all of the phalanges are above when we're looking at the position of all of the femur. Um, I honestly, when we're looking at directional terms with, with the arms and the legs, it's not that you can't use anatomical position to make those comparisons, but Anatomical position makes it hard for us to understand why we have to have proximal and distal. Um, the arms can move, which is why we have to have proximal and distal. So if you're trying to figure out where to say something in the arms and the legs are, consider what happens when you move the arms. It's not that we can't compare with anatomical position. It's just that it probably would be helpful to think about the fact that um, arms don't stay in one place. They do move around because that can change things a little bit for us. Because again, like I told you, if we were in class, I would, would do jumping jacks with you and we would start with the fact, yoga in the park guy here, we'd start by saying, hey, look, the, the humerus, the bone up here is above 
the radius and the ulna that are that are down here when I'm in, in anatomical position, kind of. He's not totally, but kind of. But when I put my arm up or when I do a jumping jack, now the radius and the ulna are above the humerus. So the, the problem with the limbs, we can do the same thing. I joke with, with my students, we can do the same thing with the leg. The, the femur is above the tibia and the fibula until we all do a handstand, right? Until he goes upside down. He's yoga in the park, guys, so he can do this. Until he does a handstand, suddenly these are above the femur. So the big thing with the arms, for the most part, the arms and the legs, you're going to make comparisons that have to do with proximal and distal. Um, you're generally probably not going to see comparisons like the one that I just made here, comparing the hand to the femur. Um, we, we won't usually make you think in those terms. Uh, but that was a good question. Consider that those arms don't stay in anatomical position is my, my short answer there. Right? Yeah, he's got, a, he's got a pretty fun dancing pose going on there. <laughs> uh, so we've got a question in the chat that is asking us to compare the phalanges of the hands to the stomach. Let me see if I've got a picture with organs with me. Okay, we got some organs here. Alas, we don't have the phalanges of the hand, right? So I'm going to go real creepy on you. We're going to pretend we got the land Jesus of the hand here. Okay. This actually reminds me, I don't get to watch a lot of, of movies right now, but I feel like I've watched some movie recently where someone like loses most of their arms or, or maybe I'm thinking of like star Wars when, uh, when he's going evil, when Anakin's going evil and got the mechanical hand. Um, regardless, I have my phalanges right here. And uh, my stomach, I'll draw a little arrow for us since I can't have you guys point for me. There's my stomach right there. And we've got our mechanical hand with those phalanges going on over here. Whether my arm is down here on the side like I drew it or whether my arm is up here, I can always compare how close my stomach is. So my, my arrow with the stomach, let me have a pointer back here. I can always compare my stomach to, to the hands by making comparison that this is in the middle, it's, it's by the torso, and this is hanging toward the outside. Whether I'm in anatomical position, whether I'm doing that jumping jack, whether I've got that lightsaber, right, and I'm out swinging it around out here, the phalanges are always gonna be farther toward the outside of the body. So if I'm comparing these bones that are farther to the outside of the body, we would say that the phalanges are, are blank to the stomach. What do you think we'd say? The phalanges are, yeah, so I've got, got several of us chiming in. We would say that, that these finger bones are lateral or they're farther toward the, the outside of the body than the stomach is. So that's, a, that's another good general statement to consider. If we're comparing to something that's found in the torso, to something that's on an appendage, probably most of the time, um, so if we're comparing torso stuff to arm stuff, probably the comparison we're making is lateral versus medial. Uh, if we're comparing torso stuff to leg stuff, we're probably comparing superior to inferior. Because this is, is around the same height, not entirely, but around the same height as the stomach. But it's always going to be here more toward the outside. It's always going to be more lateral. Uh, Jacqueline's asking the question about the word superficial. Can someone, yeah, so, so Miriam's hinting at it, at it, us for, uh, bleh, can't talk this morning, hinting at it. When we talk about superficial um, and deep, it has to be stuff that are surrounding each other. So this, the, the arm is not surrounding the stomach. Uh, we could say, though, that if we were talking about the skin, for example, uh, if we were talking about abdominal muscles, for example, those are the kind of things that we can make a comparison for, for superficial versus deep. So uh, let me go back to that picture. Best thing to remember with superficial versus deep, we've got to be completely surrounded. If we're completely surrounded by something, then we get to use that comparison. That's the only time. 
just like we only get to use, uh, the only time we can use proximal and distal is when it's two things on a leg or two things on an arm. That's the only time we get to use those ones as well. All right, I've talked a lot. Um, okay, Lauren's got a question. Go ahead, Lauren. Okay, so I had a question when we were talking about the phalanges of the foot and like what directional term we would use for that. And we decided on, I think it was distal that we decided on. But I know you said that distal and proximal would be used on like say the same limb, like the leg. Would you consider like the foot and the leg to be all one like thing together, if that makes any sense? And so we would have like we would use proximal and distal, or would you consider it to be like two different? Um, yeah. So I, 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 I think I, I think I get at, at what your question is is talking about because I've had students ask me this before actually. So thank you for for mentioning it. When I say things that are on the same limb, or I think the way that the lab packet mentions it is the same appendage, uh, we're talking about everything that attaches from the hip all the way down. That's considered one appendage. So from, from your hip bones down to your the bones of your feet, all of the bones of your feet, that's considered part of one limb. Or everything from your shoulder bones down to those fingers, that's all considered one appendage or, or one limb. So for the sake of our directional terms, yes, we're saying that the hand is part of, of the arm. If we want to get, get really technical, um, th this will make more sense next week when we start doing directional terms. So technically, this upper part of your leg is called your thigh. Technically, the only part of your leg that in anatomy speak we call the leg is like your shin area. And then we've got the foot down here. So the thigh, the leg, and the foot, all of these things are, are what in normal person words we call the leg, or we say are part of the same appendage. Technically, in anatomy speak, this up here is your arm. The place where the humerus is is the arm. This area right here is called the forearm. And the area at the very bottom, obviously, is, is the hand, right? But all of those things when we're, we're using normal person words, not anatomy speak, we call all of these things the arm. So yeah, excellent question. With, with proximal and distal, we are, um, we're talking about all of the things that are attached from one attachment point. So from everything from the shoulder down is considered the arm. Everything from the hip down is considered the leg. So the feet and the hands are included when we're, we're talking about using proximal and distal. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, so I don't know if we addressed it or not. So uh, help me out, friends in the chat. Nicole is asking, um, the heart is deep compared to the ribs? Yes or no, the heart is deep. Yeah, so several of us are, are confirming. <clears throat> Imagine my little heart here in the middle of the rib cage that forms here on the outside. There's ribs in the front of it. There's ribs on the outside. There's ribs behind. So we would say the heart is deep. That's correct. Okay, so here's what I want to do. Uh, okay, Hannah's got a question. And for those of you, I will get your question, Hannah. Um, and those of you who are feeling okay, shoot me an emoji just so I can get a feeling for, for where we're at. Thumbs up or otherwise, I don't care. Um, go ahead with your question. <clears throat> yeah, I hope this isn't a dumb question, but for uh, describing the different uh, directional terms, is it possible that you could have more than one directional term or is it just one that you're looking for? So on your assignments, there's generally going to just be one directional term that we're looking for. Uh, but you're absolutely right that when we compare things, there might be more than one that would be true. Uh, so that's why I, I told you guys the, the phrase, keep it simple. Whatever is the most obvious or maybe the most true, that's probably the one that we're looking for on, on the assignment. There might be more than one that, that could maybe be right if we squinted or if we thought about a certain way like, oh yeah, that could, could be true too. 
find the one that's the most true, that's probably the one that we're looking for. So yes, there could be more than one. Ch pick the most obvious one or the, the most straightforward one. Sometimes anatomy is tricky, but with directional terms, we're gonna try not to be too tricky. I did have someone ask a question and I had missed it before, so let me make sure I hit it really fast. Somebody asked the question about uh, the trachea and the esophagus. So I want to show you guys, this is a picture from your worksheet uh, that shows one of our class models. Specifically, the part of this model we care about is, is up here. Now, it can be a little hard to get a reference point for this, but this is the front of the face over here on the right. And then this is the front of the neck. In your neck, you have two tubes. We actually only ask you to label one of those tubes on this picture. Um, can you guys help me out in the chat? Which tube did we ask you to label the pink tube back here? Did we figure out what organ this one was? Yeah, so we were, were questioning this one, right? So the two tubes that we have in the neck, we have the tube in the very front that I actually didn't ask you to label on this picture, although I'll show you. We did ask you to label it on this one. The tube here in the front is the trachea. It's a good thing for you, by the way, that the trachea is your tube in the front, because you remember, if you've ever watched a medical TV show, when they talk about doing a tracheotomy to put a tube directly into the throat, we want to have that, that trachea, the breathing tube, here in the front. So when I go back to this picture here, this big open space here in the front, that's where the trachea is. And back behind it, like a few of us have confirmed, is your esophagus. And yes, the esophagus is part of the digestive system. Uh, if we had done our, our normal course introduction, I would have actually told you guys on day one, my favorite system technically is the digestive system uh, because I did my, my graduate school research looking into the bacteria that live in your digestive system. So fun fact about Dr. Aulis is she loves the digestive system including the esophagus back here. So the esophagus is the tube right here. The trachea is the tube in front of it. Um, when we compare these two tubes to each other, we're going to compare that one of them's in the front and one of them is in the back. These two tubes do not wrap around each other. I get that question a lot. The trachea doesn't wrap all the way around the esophagus. So I'm not gonna use deep and superficial to compare them. The trachea is in front of the esophagus. So I'm gonna use the directional term anterior when I'm describing where the trachea is compared to the esophagus. And when I'm talking about where the esophagus is compared to the trachea, I would say that the esophagus is posterior to the trachea. So keep in mind with these two tubes in your throat, they don't wrap around each other. One of them is in front of the other one, which is why I wouldn't use superficial and deep. Yeah, I'd use anterior and posterior. That's absolutely right. All right, I think I got a lot of thumbs up, a lot of smiley faces. Um, ooh, we even got a party going on. That's excellent. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. I wanna take a little bit of time, since, since directional terms was our big thing, we wanted to make sure we understood. I wanna do a, a quick learning activity with you guys. Um, to, to reinforce these directional terms. Um, now bear with me because my screen is gonna look like it's going down a bunny hole because I'm gonna, gonna show you guys something really fast. So ignore most of the screen that's like diving, right? Here's what I want you guys to notice. Right here on the screen, so see this little arrow right here? When I split you guys up into groups in just a moment, I'm gonna need someone in your group to click on this little arrow um, when you click on this little arrow right here, there's an option that says share files. When you click on share files, I have put in a little brief PowerPoint here for you to work with, with your groups on. So when someone in your group goes to do our little box with the arrow here, you'll click on this, you'll uh, go into the share files. And when we click on group work and you hit share now, 
It's going to pull up. The first slide has the directions with your group. Oh, I didn't want it to do that, though. Let me stop sharing. Show you my screen again. Whoops. I lost it all. Sorry, guys. <clears throat> Show that screen. Okay. So I get to, whoops, get to take you down the bunny hole again. So share files, group work. When you click share now, it'll let you pick your slide, read the directions on slide one, and then somebody in your group write down your answers for the activity. I'm going to give us five minutes to do this activity, and then I'm going to close out your groups. So please do chat with each other because it's going to be five minutes of awkward silence if you don't. So I'm going to split you up into groups. Remember, we're looking at this little arrow right here. So click on this, share files, and get to work. So let me get you divided up, and I will see you guys in five minutes. It just went away. Uh oh. <laughs> I just dumped everyone out again. Okay, sorry guys. I'm gonna group you up again. It just finally works. I know one of you There's guys. Nothing one in of my the room. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's what happens, and I'm gonna fix this for you guys. I have to go into each room and upload the file for you. So I'm gonna break you up again. So sorry. And I'll get that file posted for you. So experiment round number two. Here we go.
your okay. Okay. Bye. I snuck you all out of your groups. I'm sorry if I ended any <laughs> conversation. Since we are all back together in the main room, go ahead and turn off your mics for me so we don't get some echo. What I want us to do really fast, um, all of you should see the main screen in front of you that shows the slide that we, we saw in group work. So in the middle of that screen, let me get my pointer here. Middle of that screen, you should see this big word here, umbilicus. That is what we were comparing things to. So your job in the group work was to come up with some structures that are superior to the umbilicus, that are lateral to the umbilicus, posterior and inferior to the umbilicus. Hey, by the way, in the chat, did we figure out what this umbilicus is? I'm sure you all could guess based on some words you, you've heard other places. Yeah, the umbilicus is the belly button or the navel. So we were comparing, we were finding things compared to the belly button. So here's what I want you guys to do. Um, you were each divided into groups and you made lists. Um, so hopefully we have some structures in mind already that we came up with to answer these questions. Um, above what you see on your screen, so it should be kind of right above where I'm, I'm pointing right now, there's a letter T up there. If you click on that T, I think it should let you uh, start typing on, on this whiteboard. Can someone try to start typing one of the structures your group came up with? I want to see if it works that way. If not, we might have to do, oh, perfect. Okay, so it's working. Um, so if you want to go ahead and start typing some of the things that you and your group came up with, um, I want to see how many things we can get on our list um, up here. So for your structures that were superior, we'll list them over here. Structures that were inferior, structures that were posterior, or structures that were lateral to the umbilicus. Let's go ahead and, and try to start typing in some of our answers to see what kind of uh, list we came up with. Very nice. I'm seeing I'm seeing a lot of bones, some of those organs that that we're learning this week. Fun fact, I don't have a lot of free time. Um, but occasionally I like to dabble in um, the New York Times crossword puzzle. And there was a clue yesterday that said um, the patella's location. And I was like, oh my gosh, my heart, is, my life is complete. Like my anatomy is shown up in the New York Times crossword puzzle. So I like that we, we thought of the patella. I was able to correctly fill in that, that four blank space there with the word knee. The location of the patella is the knee. All right, so we're we're still filling in a little bit, but this is looking excellent. So um, th the goal of this activity was to get us to think about relationship words, right? So um, when we're comparing things to the belly button and we're talking about things that are lateral, uh, the good news is uh, Almost everything in the body, probably, except for the stuff along the very midline of the body, would be considered lateral. So those kidneys, absolutely, they're kind of up and to the side of, of the umbilicus. Uh, those arm bones, the radius and the ulna, the humerus, too, um, those are great things that we would say are, are lateral to the umbilicus. So things that are toward the outside. I want to add the name of a few other bones. Let's see if we know where these bones are yet. Uh, these bones are called the ilium and the ischium. In the chat, help me out. Do we have any idea where the ilium and the ischium bones are? Yeah, so, so Lauren's absolutely right. These are two of the hip bones. 
Um, so your hip is made of three separate bones. Uh, the way I like to help my students remember, the ilium is the bone that you put your hands on when you put your hands on your hips. The ischium is the bone that you sit on. Um, and then there, there's a third bone that I, I didn't include on the list because it, it may not quite be lateral. Um, the, the third bone that I would actually say probably is more inferior, I'll add it over here to our inferior side, is the pubis. Uh, the pubis is the one that's found in the very front of the hips. So I would say that that one it is more straight underneath umbilicus. So I'll put that one in the inferior section. Uh, so we got a comment in the chat. Ish is cush, like a cushion. Yeah, I love it. Yep. So so the ischium, cushy, um, or you know, if, if it's the bone, right? It's not quite as as cushy as as we'd want it to be. But yeah, that's a great way to remember it. So. You sit on your, technically the structure you sit on, I'll, I'll add it on here. We're going to learn this in the second half of the semester. It's called the ischial, uh, ischial tuberosity. Ischial tuberosity. Words you don't have to worry about yet. Um, it, it's a, a flat space on the ischium bone that you sit on top of. The part uh, that you put your hands on, just as a, a heads up for us, that part of the bone is called the iliac crest. That's when you put your hands on your hip, you're, you're touching the iliac crest. When you sit down, you're on that ischial tuberosity, that, that cushion. That's not quite cushy enough, right? And then the pubis, the bone in the middle, in the front side. So I'd say that one is underneath the umbilicus, or it's down below um, the, the navel, the belly button. Some of our superior structures, absolutely right. So the brain, the trachea, the urinary bladder. Uh, I, might, I might question urinary bladder. Um, I actually, okay, that, that one looks like actually we put it down here. Um, so urinary bladder, I think, is more of an inferior structure since that's found at the very bottom of the pelvis. Um, and then we've got, so below the pelvis, then we've got all the, the leg bones, um, the, the plantar region, absolutely right. And I mentioned that patella for us there, um, totally right on, on that kind of stuff. Um, there was a question in the chat about this pubis one here. That is correct. Yes, the pubis is the third bone that we find making up. Your so um, as a kid, you just learn that you learn the hip bone, right? Um, there is technically a name for the three hip bones together. Sometimes you'll see things called os coxae. Um, so os coxae is the three, uh, three hip bones together. So os coxae, that is the ilium the ischium, and the pubis, the three bones that make up make up your hip. Miriam has a question. Go for it. I'm sorry. I got confused here uh, for a moment. So we are doing those directions. Um, so when we say, for instance, that we wanted to find the whatever organs or bones that are superior to the umbilicus or the other way around? Because I got confused. That's why I put the urinary bladder on that superior position to the umbilicus. OK, yeah, so um, that's actually a great question. And it shows why it's important uh, when you're working on this on your homework assignment and on the worksheet to check the order that it's in. Um, because, yeah, if we had the urinary bladder uh, if, if we'd had the word umbilicus first, so if we said the umbilicus is superior to the urinary bladder would be correct. Um, if we're saying that the urinary bladder is blank to the umbilicus, then we would, would use inferior. So you're absolutely right. Um, that's a great point to make. Um, it, it does depend on the order, like Lauren said in the chat, absolutely. So I, I guess I should have been a little bit more specific with us, right? So uh, the way I envisioned us doing this is figuring out a structure that would go before the directional term. So the diaphragm is superior to the umbilicus or the nasal bone is superior to the umbilicus. Uh, but, but you're 100% correct that we could have done it the other way. So we could have said the umbilicus uh, is superior to the urinary bladder or um, the, the umbilicus, well, I guess the, the one where it kind of breaks down is lateral, right? The umbilicus isn't really lateral to anything. Um, but hey, if I wanted to compare 
these things, if I wanted the umbilicus to be first, the umbilicus is blank to the ulna. What word would I use in, in that blank? The umbilicus is, yeah, it'd be the opposite. So what's the opposite of lateral? Yeah, medial. So the umbilicus is medial to the ulna or exact same statement, just worded the other way. The ulna is lateral to the umbilicus. So yeah, 100%, I'm sorry about the, the weirdness with those arrows. Um, you're totally right though, and it makes a great point that we need to make sure we check the order that those organs are listed in um, to help us make sure we put the, the right word in that blank. So um, I love it. I guess the one we hadn't talked about is, is the umbilicus, or excuse me, is, is posterior, right? Um, vertebrae is, is a great example. Um, I, I am a little bit saddened, not actually, but I'm going to pretend. I'm a little bit saddened that none of us put small intestine or posterior to the umbilicus because right behind your, um, your belly button is the small intestine. Uh, fun fact on the small intestine, as a reminder for us, the small intestine, it's a small tube, but there's a lot of it. So the small intestine, there, there's a whole lot of the small intestine. The large intestine, it looks um, smaller, if you will, but it's a much wider tube. That's how it got its name. So to make sure you don't mix them up, the small intestine is actually right behind your belly button. It's the, the mess of, of tubes. Uh, lots of, of, it's a long, small tube, the small intestine, and that is posterior to the umbilicus. Along with things, um, yeah, possibly like the stomach or the vertebrae is a really good one as well for things that are, are posterior. I know we mainly just hit on directional terms. That was, that was our big thing that we were asking about, but I want you guys to help me out in the chat. Um, are there so the, the things that I picked up from a word cloud? We also had maybe a few questions about organ system functions or those body cavities. If you could, in the chat box for me, um, text me what particular questions you have. I want to make sure that, that we get those answered for you. And I'm glad to hear, Lauren, that it, that it helped you. Perfect. Yeah, those directional terms, it's really just practice. So I'm glad we got to have this, this practice together with the belly button. I'm glad that worked out. And if you feel like you're good, by the way, feel free to shoot me, shoot me an emoji. I think I showed you guys this on, uh, on Monday. These were the ones that my, uh, my spring students liked. We, we would sometimes have little dance parties. Thumbs up, smiley faces, dance parties. I like it. I, I, I mentioned to you guys, but never actually uh, gave you, I, I mentioned how I like that penguin emoji. Here you go. For the, for the first time in the fall semester, I'm going to draw you guys a little penguin here. It's looking pretty terrible today. By the end of the fall semester, they're going to look a lot better. I'm a little out of practice of drawing my, my penguins for you guys. So please keep, uh, if, you, if you have questions, please type it into the chat for me. So I know what questions to address before we before we call it a day. We're all mesmerized with with Dr. Alice's penguin, right? When I was in uh, high school, for some reason, I thought that it was really fun to draw green penguins. So I'll even give you a green penguin. We'll just we'll just go big all out here with the green penguin. There we go. What's his name? That's an excellent question. Um, I don't know if he has a name yet. I should probably come up with some anatomy name for him. Um, if you asked my daughter, her name for any stuffed animal right now is whatever the stuffed animal is. So our current favorite stuffed animal is chipmunk. Um, so I guess we would just call this guy penguin. This is penguin. <laughs> oh, he had the crazy penguin from Surf's Up. Yeah, that I, I could definitely see that for sure. All right, so um, Jacqueline's mentioning only seeing two assignments um, in Blackboard. So far, yes, that's correct, Jacqueline. I, uh, 
was going to post more last night and then my daughter stayed up late. So um, you will see more than that. Um, it's gonna go up through week six. Um, hopefully by the end of the day today, you'll see that. So um, there's only two up there right now. The only one due this week is the lesson number one um, assignment. So that's the only one you have to worry about and more assignments to come. Um, let's see. Yeah, chatter about green penguins. I, I was going through, um, I moved in December, and so I have some boxes of, of junk that I have to, to sort through, and I found, I did this whole cartoon um, about like natural selection and genetic drift and like all this stuff for my biology class, and I did it with green penguins. So I have this cartoon of, of green penguins explaining genetic drift that I'll have to show to my uh, three-year-old when she's a little older. <laughs> Um, let's see. Uh, Kai is asking about the guided lab activities. Do we need to do them? Um, so the guided lab activities are designed to help you complete your worksheet. If you have other resources that you want to use to complete that worksheet and you'd rather not use those, that's totally fine. Um, but that's de designed to, to help you work through that material. Um, optional is not graded but it has some good resources for you. So take it or leave it, that, that's your call, whatever is most effective for you. Um, Nicole asked, when you get a question wrong on Blackboard, does it tell you the correct answer on the grading page? It does not tell you the correct answer on the grading page. Um, it will show you all of the answers that, that could have gone into that blank, um, and then you just kinda need to troubleshoot and figure it out. Um, I am willing to talk about specific questions with you on the homework assignment if you have specific ones, but it's not going to, to give you that correct answer. Um, the goal being that you go back and complete the assignment again uh, to work on getting full credit, figure out what answer was incorrect and um, figure out how to make that, that answer correct. Um, let me take Miriam's question and then I'm, I'll, I'll go to the, the two next things in the chat. Go for it, Miriam. Okay, uh, so uh, regarding the lab uh, assignments, uh, from my understanding so far, um, it's under the lab resources, and then it will be uh, not the guided lab activities. It's just going to be the very bottom, the weekly lab homework, right? That's correct. Um, is that in additional to the um, the the visible visible buddy assignments? Yes, that is correct. So two assignments, visible body assignments are due on Fridays. They're always due first. So two visible body assignments that are due this Friday and then one Blackboard assignment that's due on Sunday. So start with doing the visible body assignments since they're due first and then work on those, those Blackboard assignments as well. I am about out of time. Let me briefly wrap together Jacqueline's question and Lauren's question. My opinion on flashcards is um, flashcards can be a waste of time to build unless you have enough time to study them. Um, from this week's lab packet, what I think would be best for flashcards is the directional terms, what those directional terms mean. But if you've got those directional term meanings down already, don't waste your time making flashcards. Um, flashcards are, are helpful if you have distinct little pieces of information you need to know. A lot of what you need to know for lecture is probably not good for flashcards. So my short answer to um, good study tips, my, my good study tips advice today and, and Lauren's question tied into one, don't waste your time on flashcards. Build them specifically um and build them early to make sure you have time to use them um, and we can definitely talk some more tomorrow about study tip stuff um but that that's my one my one nugget that i'll give you guys today don't waste your time on flashcards if you make a few that are specific just with information you don't know um, that might be helpful for you it is 10:58. Unfortunately, I am going to have to peace out to uh, pass on my webcam. 
Um, but I am available via email all day today, and I will try to get back to you guys if you have, have other specific questions about stuff. Um, but for now, I'm going to call it, call it a wrap. Uh, thank you all for coming today that, that you learned something and, and had a good time. And I look forward to seeing hopefully several of you again tomorrow morning. So I'm going to stop that recording. And like I said, feel free to, to email with any questions you have.